Um, good morning, everyone. I hope everyone can hear. So, yeah, I'm Sarvan Heru. I'm um, a postdoc scientist in the Department of uh, Chemical Engineering, and I work with Magdalena Titiricci. And we work in the field of fuel cells, um, electrolyzers, hydrogen production, and also uh, electrochemical energy storage. So I'm going to share with you some work we've done on uh, sustainable uh, supercapacitors and touch down a little bit at the end in uh, potential structural applications. So um, just um, to share with you this interesting research uh, that has been recently done um, and that puts um, that compares actually the, the decrease in, um, in CO2 uh, emissions with uh, uh, various uh, recent uh, world events. So you can see on the left axis, you have uh, different uh, economical crises. The first one in 2008 of the subprimes, then the, the Spanish flu, um, the Second World War, and you can see the different um, uh, um, CO2 emissions, the reduction in CO2 emissions that uh, happens during the, the year. Um, and you can see that the corona crisis uh, uh, has had a massive impact in our CO2 emissions. There is nearly a drop of 6%. And just to put this in, in perspective with the global challenges we're trying to achieve with the Paris Agreement to try to keep the global temperature um, uh, beneath 1.5 degrees uh, increase, um, that, would, that would mean that uh, on the world level, we would have to uh, maintain our uh, uh, CO2 emissions uh, by 7.6%, uh, we will have to decrease them by 7.6% for the next decade. So that sets up the challenge. And if we look at uh, the CO2 emissions, uh, we know that there are also uh, uh, other greenhouse gases em uh, emissions, uh, such as methane and uh, nitrous oxide. And this come uh, primarily from electricity and heat production, but also from agriculture with the use of pesticides, but also industry and transportation, of course. So in the field of transportation, we are tackling uh, uh, this uh, by um, trying to electrify uh, transportation, as you're widely aware of. And that happens by uh, putting batteries and replacing electric um, uh, standard fossil fuel powered motor motors by um, batteries and uh, supercapacitors. But of course, this largely changed the landscape in terms of resources that we need because all electronic devices uh, need uh, rarer resources than uh, the ones that are needed to uh, build um, combustion engines. And therefore, if you look at uh, this map here on the, on the left side, you can see uh, the Mendeley table with all of the um, elements in green, which are widely available on Earth, and all the elements in uh, red uh, that are, uh, let's say, endangered species. And um, all of the ones with a white icon here are the ones that are used in our phones or either electronics or batteries. So here the challenge of the 21st century is to really manage to find a solution to reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions without compromising um, the sustainable aspect of, um, of resources on Earth. So there are several ways we can store electricity. Um, uh, here are four examples. Uh, on the extreme left, you have the electrical double layer capacitors, and on the extreme right, you have the batteries. Um, here on the first line, you can see uh, what we call the electrochemical signature. These are uh, cyclovolt thermograms. Uh, it means that when you are basically charging your device, you have your positive terminal and negative terminal, anode or cathode. And uh, basically, when you are uh, controlling the potential of this and you're recording the current, this is called a cyclovolt thermogram. And the cyclovolt thermogram of a supercapacitor is square or rectangular like this. Um, and the cyclovolt thermogram of a battery is, uh, you can see these massive redox peaks here. Um, the second line here corresponds to galvanostatic charge discharge. So here, instead of uh, controlling the potential on the terminals of the, of the device, we control the current and we measure the potential. And that gives us basically for the supercapacitors a linear correlation and for battery, a plateau correlation. So the supercapacitor, why does it have um, a rectangular CV? Is because um, uh, the electrolyte that is placed between the two electrodes, um, upon polarization of the device, the ions in the electrolyte are going to um, 
uh, diffuse towards the surface of the porous electrode and adsorb onto the surface. And this process is very uh, rapid and should not depend on the voltage of the device. And that's why you obtain this uh, rectangular shape. In the, in the case of the battery lithium ion you're probably aware of, um, you have intercalation. So the, the charges, in this case lithium, diffuse inside the material on the anode, uh, usually graphite, and on the cathode, um, for example, lithium cobalt oxide. Um, and this intercalation induces a phase change, and that is observable either on the plateau of the galvanostatic charge discharge or on the peak of the CP. And of course, uh, batteries, the fact that the charges intercalate means that you can store much more energy. So they have high energy density. Here you can see on the, the Ragoni plot here on the bottom uh, right. Uh, here, uh, the batteries uh, have energy densities between 100 to several hundreds of watt hour per kilogram. Whereas electrocapacitors, electrochemical capacitors have uh, energy densities that are much lower, usually five watt hour per kilogram but much higher power density because the, um, the kinetics of this ion surface option is much uh, faster than uh, the intercalation of the ions inside the material. Um, how does a supercapacitor work? So I just said that um, we basically have a porous carbon that is usually um, coated on, uh, on the surface of um, uh, conductive uh, metal foil that can be aluminum, that can be copper, um, and uh, basically these are winded up in uh, this type of cell where there is also a separator in the middle that is soaked in the electrolyte and allows to uh, keep all the device wet. Um, and when the, the device is polarized, um, the ions are diffusing towards the surface, forming what we call an electrical double layer. And this is composed of a diffuse layer where the ions are diffusing towards the surface and the stern layer, which is the first layer of ions um, uh, right close to the, to the electrode. And compared to um, standard dielectric capacitors that you've probably uh, heard about uh, that are using electronics, um, these dielectric capacitors have, instead of having an electrolyte here, they have a dielectric material which allow them to be used at really high voltage. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, because uh, they are the, the charges available are only the electrons within the electrode, they don't have a lot of capacitance. So that's why they are in this uh, field here on the graph. Uh, whereas uh, supercapacitors, they have electrolyte ions, which adds on to the charges available to create the capacitance. So they have really high capacitance, but unfortunately we can't use them at really high voltage because otherwise we would um, destroy the electrolyte and that's why they are on this end of the graph. So um, I'm talking about uh, briefly about pseudo capacitance. It's uh, uh, basically a process that is in between a standard double layer capacitor and a battery. Uh, you could see this on the previous slide um, and that can be created either by oxygen groups on the surface of carbon uh, materials or also by uh, certain metal oxides. But what is important here is to uh, take into account the fact that to calculate the energy density of your device, you need to multiply the capacitance by the voltage window uh, squared. And this voltage window is very important and that's why to increase the, uh, the energy we're trying to increase the voltage window. And that can be done by using uh, aqueous electrolytes, uh, which are 1.7 volts. Um, but also organic solvents, which can go up to 2.7 volts, or even more recently discovered ionic liquid, uh, which can go from 4 to 5 volts. And here you will notice that the power is inversely proportional to the resistance, so you're really looking um, into uh, uh, highly electrically conductive materials for supercapacitors. So just to state that supercapacitors, they are used today in, uh, in certain uh, EV buses in China, but also um, in other uh, public transportation such as ferries. Um, they're also used in excavators as a hybrid uh, component to provide uh, 60 horsepower of, um, of supplementary power. And the main difference with battery also is that they can have a massive cyclability. So they have like a, a life of over 
15 years compared to certain batteries. In our lab, um, when we build our supercapacitor, uh, you can see here we have two stainless steel rods that are anti-corrosion steel, and we put our electrodes uh, like this. There is no, um, no substrate, no foil. Uh, that's why it's called a freestanding electrode. Then we add the electrolyte, we soak it, we add here the, um, uh, the glass fiber separator, and then we press the whole thing. We connect the counter electrode, the blue cable, to one terminal, the working electrode, the red cable, to the other terminal. And we have here a reference electrode that allows the, us to um, monitor both uh, potential uh, independently. And so we need more efficient materials. Um, activated carbon materials uh, are. Um, the commercial ones are not really efficient because their uh, pore structure is not really um, uh, designed uh, for the ions. So recently, we, we used to think that the capacitance increases with the surface area of, uh, of the carbons, as it's written in this, uh, uh, in this formula here, with A, the material surface area. But actually, we recently discovered 10 years ago that the more you decrease the pore size, the more uh, the capacitance starts to increase. And here the challenge is to create materials that, are, um, that have the right pore size to uh, really maximize uh, the capacitance. So in my group, we use a lot of uh, sustainable uh, bio um, polymers. So some of my colleagues are working on sugars, proteins, um, but on this project, we've been working on lignin. So it's a massive biopolymer that you can find in the, in the plant cell walls. It's quite complex, so I won't go into details. But basically, it's produced in 70 million tons per year by the paper industry. And basically, only 2 million, um, only 2%, sorry, of uh, this lignin is used to make fuels, but also adhesives, resins, uh, and also carbon nanofibers. Uh, all carbon fibers that I'm going to present a little bit more in detail here. So what we've been doing uh, is um, solubilizing our lignin uh, in a nanoH solution with 0.5 molar concentration. We add a little bit of polyethylene oxide and we use electrospinning to transform this solution um, into a nanofiber mat. So electrospinning is basically you put your solution into a syringe, you have a needle here, uh, you put 20 kilovolts between this needle and an aluminum plate that serves as collator, and basically the solution gets pulled and transformed into nanofibers. These nanofibers are then uh, uh, placed into an oven under nitrogen gas at 800 degrees, and uh, the uh, sodium hydroxide starts uh, activating the fibers, creating microporosity inside the fibers. And this one is very important for supercapacitors. And then you can uh, wash away the remaining uh, salt, uh, the remaining uh, NaOH, in a, in a bath with hot water at 85 degrees. So uh, we've been looking why these fibers are particularly interesting. Um, if you spin them, you can see on the surface all of the little uh, sodium hydroxide crystals. They're approximately between uh, 60 and 80 nanometers. And basically, if you take the same spinning solution, but instead of spinning it, you just cast it into a petri dish and let it dry, then uh, if you look at the, here are the EDX and the SEM pictures, you look at uh, these crystals are uh, approximately between 10 and 50 microns. And that has a massive influence on the properties. We performed XRD before carbonization, and you can see uh, the characteristic uh, monoclinic phase here of. Uh, sodium carbonate, so basically the sodium hydroxide carbonates directly as soon as it's in contact with air. Uh, and here, if you look at the, uh, the nitrogen sorption, which tells you the surface area after carbonization, then you can see that the, the powdered material, so the casted material here, has only 60 square meter per gram, whereas the carbon nanofibers have 650. And that tells you that basically, if you in the case of the powder, the slow evaporation of the solvent, of the water in this case, uh, is basically um, uh, creating a sort of phase separation between the salt and the lignin, and that doesn't lead to a uh, high surface area formation. Whereas in the case of fibers, the surface area is very large because since the water evaporates very, very fast during the spinning, 
um, the sodium hydro the sodium hydroxide doesn't have the time to separate from the lignin, and that leads to really high surface area. And compared to standard procedure, where people do chemical activation, you probably heard about this. Um, they use usually a salt ratio to polymer that is much higher than the polymer content, so two to eight. But in our case, because we use electrospinning and this fast solvent uh, evaporation, we're able to use 10% of the polymer weight. And that, uh, of course, is a great advantage in terms of cost and also uh, scalability. So um, the performance in supercapacitors, you can see uh, the distinguishable uh, rectangular CV shape here on the left at five millivolt per second, which is quite slow uh, charging rate. And if you go a bit faster, you see that we still maintain this uh, rectangular CV shape and the powder doesn't show even uh, any capacitance at this scan rate. And that is shown on the rate uh, capability where you can see the gravimetric capacitance on the uh, y-axis and the current density, and we see that the carbon nanofibers maintain their uh, high capacitance despite, uh, despite the high current density. And here, this is to put in perspective this material with uh, commercial activated carbons, where uh, usually the gravimetric energy density is between one to five watt hour per kilogram, and here we manage to obtain eight, nine uh, watt hour per kilogram, which is uh, worth investigating more in detail. So why do these uh, fibers perform well in aqueous media? Uh, well, first, because we have low tortuosity. As you can see, we have huge pores here, uh, micrometer sized pores, um, that, leaves, uh, that allows the electrolyte basically to penetrate the material and be in contact with all the fibers. They also have adequate pore size. Uh, you can see here the pore size uh, was found to be approximately 0.5 nanometers which is roughly the size of the, uh, the um, potassium and uh, hydroxyl ions that we use in our electrolytes. And also they have good wettability. They have uh, oxygen on the surface and uh, we can also characterize uh, whether uh, these oxygen groups are acidic uh, or basic by temperature program desorption. And finally, before finishing, I'd like to um, present some work we've been doing to try to improve the density of these materials. Because the problem of these carbon nanofiber mats is that they have densities uh, below uh, 0.1 gram per cubic centimeter. And commercial activated carbon are approximately at 0.5. And of course, 2.2 is uh, pure graphite, non-porous graphite. And between one and 1.6, it's usually graphene. But it's very hard to make a material uh, above basically one point. 25 gram per cubic centimeter because it would look like graphene very much and doing this from renewable resources is very 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 challenging so basically our target is to um, go beyond 0 0.8, 0 0.8 uh, gram per cubic centimeter and here is a scheme of the what we are trying to achieve for commercialization here we have low loading where you can see uh, the carbon material on the top of the aluminium foil and the more, the higher the loading, then uh, the higher the proportion of the carbon until it actually becomes a freestanding electrode. And so all the materials that we test are actually freestanding in this case. So we did the same system where uh, we compared basically the previous sample that was uh, pyrolyzed uh, just after electrospinning and a sample where we compress these mats with different number of layers and we carbonize later. And we can see that the density increases by uh, a factor six approximately. If we look on the SEM, uh, this compressed sample before carbonization, you can see the more we increase the pressure, the more the fibers start merging into the film, um, uh, which increases the density. And we've also investigated uh, the shape of the pores by uh, uh, X-ray tomography. And we can see that in the unpressed state, all these fibers are stuck on the top of each other. And in the pressed state, they start kind of rolling around and, uh, uh, de and uh, decreasing uh, the pore size from uh, approximately 5 micron to 0.5 micron. And that was quite interesting. And uh, here are the results of the tomography, where we can see the unpressed sample here uh, with a scale of 40 micron, and here a scale of 6 micron, where we can see the fiber shapes. And in color are uh, the size of the pores from 2.5 to 5 microns. 
Um, and here the press sample, uh, because all the fiber all, all the fiber merge together, we we can't uh, distinguish any uh, fibrous shape anymore. But we just see that the the size of these pores uh, has been lowered by a factor at least five to ten. And finally, the the uh, the electrochemical performances uh, we can see here by comparing the orange to the dark orange line. The the non-pressed and pressed sample have roughly uh, uh, similar uh, performances in terms of gravimetric capacitance, but in terms of volumetric, we increase uh, by a large factor the performance. These are the impedance results for uh, uh, people who um, are interested. And here, uh, the volumetric uh, um, energy versus volumetric power, where here we have the graphene-based supercapacitors, which are uh, the last generations of supercaps, highly performing one. And here, the traditional activated carbon ones. And we can see that we uh, outstand these materials uh, by a little bit. And those are the cyclability results. So I hope I could, uh, I could show you a little bit of what we've been doing uh, in our group. Uh, we have large group in the Cambridge department. And we just moved in two years ago. So uh, we are happy to chat with you um, whenever you like. Thank you. Hello. I guess uh, we should move to the next presentation. Um, yes, that would be great. Thank you. Thank you, Servan, for a nice uh, uh, talk about sustainable supercapacitors. Uh, my today's topic will cover the, the second part of uh, today's presentation, which is multifunctional structural supercapacitor. Uh, my name is Evgeny Senekos, and uh, I'm working in the uh, Department of Chemistry at Imperial College London in the group of Milo Schaffer. But uh, the Structural Power Project is the shared project be between the Department of Aeronautics and the Chemistry. So, uh, Ed Servan has already done the hard work introducing all the concept of, uh, in general, energy storage system and supercapacitor particularly. I can move forward and just um, highlight that um, the conventional approach for development and improvement of technology in energy storage system is mostly focused on maximizing uh, the amount of energy uh, which our devices can store per uh, unit weight and how quickly this energy can be delivered, which are basically the energy and power density. However, uh, this is not the only route for developing new uh, electrochemical energy storage system. The first one, uh, which already was covered by the previous speaker, is making our devices sustainable and environmentally friendly. Uh, but another one, which I will be talking today about, is basically introducing additional functionality uh, to our devices, which can actually span the possible range of uh, applications. Um, so um, there, are, there is a different range of uh, possible additional functionalities which you can find in the literature. Our energy storage system, um, for example, supercapacitor can be transparent and used in the displays, for instance, of our devices. It can have a shape memory uh, function or thermoresponsive behavior. Uh, they, have it, they can be self-healing or electrochromic, and they can change um, the, the color of the device depending on the voltage applied. Or what we are working with is making our devices mechanically robust or structural. Uh, thus, they can be operated under mechanical loads and stresses. So all these different functionality can be basically united by the similar concept where we don't just try to maximize electrochemical characteristics of our device, but we rather than um, consider the performance of our electrochemical system as a three-dimensional challenge, 
where we try to uh, maximize the power energy as well as additional functionality. Um, in case of the structural uh, energy storage system, this additional functionality is mechanical performance. Uh, to better introduce the concept of structural energy storage and supercapacitors particularly, uh, the good example is uh, electrical vehicles. So we know that the current uh, state of the art of uh, electric car batteries enables us um, to introduce the huge device of three to 600 kilograms weight, which accounts for about 20 to 30 percent of the car weight, which is quite significant and reduces the possible range which our car can pass without charging just because it becomes heavier. So the main challenge in automobile industry of electrical vehicles is trying to reduce this weight. And the way to do this uh, with the conventional approach is trying to develop new technologies of new electric materials or electrolyte materials which can uh, give us the same specific power and energy at lower weight, or in opposite can give us higher power and energy at the lower weight. However, the problem of the current uh, technologies is that our expectation and demand grow much faster than actual technologies. And for us now, it takes much more time to reach the required level of electrochemical performance uh, because most of um, the high peak investigations pretty much reach the plateau. So the alternative approach for the weight reduction of the car batteries can be developing a multifunctional uh, structural system where along with the primary uh, electrochemical functions uh, storing the energy in our device, um, the system can actually retain mechanical uh, loads and act as the reinforcement. In this case, we can particularly uh, use the bodywork of a car as a battery um, instead of having it as a separate unit. And we can, for example, replace the, the roof, the, the bodywork, um, or the chassis uh, of the car with the battery, but thus reducing the total weight of our electrochemical energy storage system. Um, the structural supercapacitor uh, is, as we say, the lower hanging fruit uh, compared to structural batteries. However, still it's quite challenging uh, um, the study um, and the task to assemble because the, every uh, constituent of this device, including electrolytes, separators, electrodes, current collection or packing, should act both as a mechanical unit as well as electrochemical energy storage um, uh, component. The electric material is one of the most essential uh, uh, elements of the structural supercapacitor and this particularly the component which I'm working on uh, in my research. So if you look at the concept of uh, architecture of the structural supercapacitor, um, you can see that the conventional supercapacitor consisting of uh, two electrodes as was introduced by Servan uh, the separator uh, and electrolyte infused inside is actually quite similar to the concept of uh, structural composite, uh, which is used uh, for mechanical reinforcement on different parts of uh, cars, bikes, or uh, buildings, or whatever, which have two carbon fiber plies, another ply in the middle, and epoxy resin infused to link all these things together and cure it. Um, so, from this perspective, uh, carbon fibers actually can be considered as the interesting uh, structural electrode because it provides high mechanical uh, properties as well as high electrical conductivity required for uh, transferring the charge in our uh, supercapacitor. The main limitation of uh, carbon fibers is its low surface area, which limits the total charge which can be accumulated uh, on the electrode and thus limiting the total capacitance and energy that can be stored in the device. So during the last years in our group, there were different attempts trying to increase the surface area of carbon fibers by uh, etching and activating the surface or depositing different nanocarbons, for example, by uh, CNT sizing approach or drawing CNTs on the surface of carbon fibers. But the most successful route was uh, infusion of carbon aerogel precursor, which is basically a 3D interconnected network of carbons forming a, a small uh, pore size uh, network between carbon fibers and on the surface of carbon fibers. Uh, to understand uh, what is this in terms of multifunctionality, it's good to um, 
illustrate, uh, as we call it, multi uh, the plot of multifunctionality of the structural power composite, where on one axis we have a performance of monofunctional, a conventional supercapacitor, uh, and another one where we compare the mechanical performance or uh, mechanical efficiency uh, compared to the conventional structural composite. So uh, in this plot, carbon original modified carbon fibers uh, based supercapacitors still doesn't cro don't cross the um, uh, monofunctional threshold after which we can consider weight reduction of our electric car uh, supercapacitor. So the question is how we can further uh, improve the performance of this system uh, to, to cross this line and basically achieving uh, the weight savings. So the first possible method is incorporation of nanocarbons inside of the uh, carbon aerogel and carbon fiber pores, which can slightly increase the electrical conductivity, but more importantly, can lead to um, some improvement of mechanical uh, performance. And another route, which was uh, partly uh, presented by Servan, is the position of sort of capacitive elements on the surface uh, of uh, carbon aerogel pores and carbon fibers. This is quite well established route in, in the field of electric chemical energy storage, in particular uh, supercapacitors to increase the energy density of our system. And manganese oxide is one of the most explored elements uh, in these attempts. So what I've been trying to do in my research is introducing the manganese oxide nanoparticles inside of the surface of uh, structural electrodes based on carbon aerogel. So the fabrication of manganese oxide decorated carbon aerogel carbon fiber composites uh, are actually a multi-step uh, uh, process which includes um, different experimental steps starting from uh, infusion, uh, vacuum assisted uh, resin infusion procedure to introduce uh, carbon aerogel organic salt precursor inside of the carbon fibers. So this procedure is actually quite a well-established route for introducing uh, epoxy resin into conventional uh, structural composites. So it's well compatible for uh, our application. So after infusion, uh, the organic soil undergoes different temperature steps uh, for curing, uh, for gelation and curing, which results in a solid piece of carbon fibers with the carbon aerogel precursor, which can be further uh, paralyzed at high temperature, leading to carbonization of uh, carbon aerogel uh, in the inert gas, forming uh, high surface area electrodes, which can be further used as the starting material for deposition of manganese oxide. The deposition of uh, manganese oxide was performed in two different routes, where in the first one, uh, the electrochemical route with the pulse potentiometric method was applied. This involves uh, oxidation of manganese 2 plus precursor species in the three electrode um, electrochemical cell, where our cat carbon fiber electrode serves as the working electrode. And manganese 2 plus species undergo different uh, steps through hydrolysis and oxidation, forming manganese oxide inside of our pores. Um, the another route is the chemical uh, redox deposition precipitation at high temperature, where permanganate uh, ions get reduced on the surface of carbon inside of the carbon aerogel pores forming manganese oxide. Uh, they have a different uh, time scale where the first chemical approach requires only one hour and the redox deposition through precipitation uh, needs four hours for being finished. Comparison of the microstructure of uh, electrodes before and after manganese oxide deposition shows that uh, our um, vacuum assisted infusion of carbon aerogel because it enables us to form a very thin and compact layer of the carbon aerogel uh, on top of the carbon fibers and between the pores, where the microstructure consists of uh, a network of small carbon particles interconnected into a mesoport channel of different sizes. The deposited manganese oxide by different uh, methods actually shows slightly different uh, morphology and microstructure. Um, the, in case of electrochemically deposited material, we have the long nanowires interconnected into large mesopores. While in case of the manganese oxide deposited chemically, we have more uniform uh, coverage with less cracks uh, appearing uh, on the surface, which is the result of the stress shrinkage appearing uh, during drying. 
And in the microstructure, it consists of the small nanoflakes uh, forming a smaller pore size compared to electrochemically deposited material. Uh, the gas adsorption analysis, which shows us the surface area of our material, uh, indicates that the two isotherms uh, of as produced carbon aerogel gel and the manganese oxide decorated material electrochemically deposited are quite similar uh, in terms of the shape as well as in resulting values of total surface area and pore volume, which shows us that uh, deposition of manganese oxide does not cause any uh, drop of uh, surface area due to, for example, blockage of carbon average of pores. Uh, and on the other hand, the T plot analysis indicates the small drop of the uh, micropore surface area and volume, which actually can be beneficial uh, considering possible um, diffusion limitations caused uh, by slow uh, diffusion of uh, electrolyte ions inside of the carbon aerogel pores. Um, these materials uh, were characterized electrochemically in a electrode cell, which was introduced by Servan, although it has slightly different uh, architecture. So again, the working electrode uh, is uh, our uh, carbon aerogel modified carbon fibers in the aqueous, typical aqueous electrolyte with the sodium sulfate salt. Uh, the cyclic voltammetries, which shows us the capacity performance of our electrodes, it is true that uh, both manganese oxide actually exhibit similar shape and behavior, indicating that uh, the change of procedure does not change significantly the performance of uh, our system. And the overall area translated into the capacitance is actually increased significantly, although it uh, decays um, at the highest scan rate due to uh, a diffusionally limited surface redox reaction happening on the manganese oxide surface, which contributes to the pseudocapacitive contribution uh, observed in our system. Um, to better understand the behavior of the full cell device, we use the Sveshlok cell, similar to uh, the one used uh, by Servan, but in this case we have two symmetric electrodes, and this type of the test, the galvanostatic charge charge, actually uh, simulates the behavior of con conventional supercapacitors, so it can be directly compared. Um, so in this case, we, we can see after the position of manganese oxide, a significant increase of the area on the discharge curve, which translates into pronounced increase of capacitance and the energy density of our system uh, after the position of pseudocapacitive elements. Um, the impedance uh, curves uh, shows that there is a slight increase of equivalent series resistance, which can be uh, taken from the semicycle of our impedance curves, which also translates to a slight drop of the power density uh, expected for pseudo capacity materials. Um, the main drawback of carbon average gel fabrication route, which is still considered the state of the art for structural electrode materials, is that it involves a high temperature step, uh, also used, for example, for uh, fabricating carbon nanofibers. Uh, presented by Servan. Uh, in this case, we can have some traces of water in our um, carbon aerogel precursor, which can cause some oxidation of carbon fibers and drop of the performance. Also, this uh, high temperature step is industrially ineffective. So, my current project focuses on uh, trying to uh, implement a low temperature alternative to carbon aerogel, which can uh, result in a supercapacitors with sufficiently high mechanical and chemical performance. So the way to achieve this, which I consider, is again multi-step route, which starts with the functionalization of the carbon fiber uh, surface. Uh, and these type of uh, fun functional groups can, be, can have quite different nature and can be produced by different uh, methods, which depend mostly on the type of material which we want to deposit on later. So in this case, for example, uh, the first attempt I was exploring is the simple oxidation of carbon fibers, which makes them hydrophilic and improves adhesion of, uh, uh, for example, conducting polymers deposited on top of the carbon fibers. So I've tried different uh, electrochemical functionalization methods uh, with the further deposition of polyanilin on top of the carbon fibers. We showed that the larger area and better electrochemical performance was achieved for pulse oxidized carbon fibers, uh, leading to more uniform uh, 
distribution of functional groups on the surface of carbon fibers, and as a result, more uniform and thin coating of uh, conducting polymers. The second step would be uh, deposition of uh, nanocarbons, or particularly carbon nanotubes. And it should be emphasized that uh, this step does not attempt to replace carbon aerogel and achieve uh, similar surface area values because uh, these materials is much less, much more porous and much less surface area contributing. Um, the main uh, goal of depositing carbon nanotubes inside of the, between the carbon fiber space and on its surface is basically giving sufficient increase of the surface area and conductivity for later deposition of supercapacitive elements. Uh, the route which we, uh, which I try to use for this purpose is um, a reductive dissolution and deposition of uh, carbon nanotubes. Uh, so this basically involves a wrapping uh, of carbon nanotubes with the charge, which electrostatically separates carbon nanotubes forming high surface area uh, materials uh, with the high concentration in the dispersion, which can be easily uh, drop casted or uh, infiltrated on top of the carbon fibers, forming uh, either a vacuum infiltrated uh, layer of CNT on the surface of carbon fibers, or ideally forming interconnected 3D network of CNTs between carbon fiber spaces. Um, the last step would be deposition of pseudocapacity materials inside of the uh, nanocarbon porous, as well as the carbon fiber surface. Uh, for this purpose, in our low temperature, the idea material would be conducting polymers because they don't only uh, give contribution to sort of capacitive uh, electrochemical properties, but also uh, can contribute and give rise to mechanical stability of other electrodes. So polyaniline uh, was the first target in this direction, and um, the position of polyaniline on, on, on top of our nanocarbon decorated functionalized carbon fibers showed that we can achieve a very thin and uniform coating of polyaniline on top of the carbon fibers, as well as on top of the CNT forming a, such a hairy structure. This results in significant increase of the performance, for example, compared to uh, the same way deposited polyaniline on top of the carbon aerogel carbon fibers, or the previously uh, shown manganese oxide uh, decoration route, which uh, translates into uh, more than the double increase of uh, capacitance of our material. Uh, to conclude with, uh, the concept of uh, structural supercapacitor is quite interesting uh, from the perspective of application in mobile energy storage uh, systems where we can achieve a weight reduction uh, in alternative route to conventional systems. However, uh, it is quite a complex task uh, which requires uh, a separate a research project for each consistent or element of our supercapacitor. Uh, the manganese oxide decoration route uh, enables us to improve the chemical performance of our structural electrode based on the carbon aerogel carbon fibers, which is currently considered being the state of the art. However, uh, its uh, impact on mechanical properties is still not yet studied. And um, uh, the last is there are other ways. Um, to uh, achieve a combination of high mechanical and chemical properties uh, without going to high temperature for carbonization of our material. And one of these methods, which I'm working on, uh, basically focuses on uh, three steps, uh, functionalization of carbon fibers, uh, assembly of uh, continuous 3D network of nanocarbons in the space between carbon fibers and the surface, and polymerization of conducting polymers both on the surface of carbon fibers and uh, uh, introduced nanocarbons. Uh, and then I would like to acknowledge my colleagues uh, who are all of them working on in the project of structural power from Department of Chemistry in the Mila Shepherds group and um, Department of Aeronautics in the group of uh, Emil Gringolf, and uh, as well as my colleagues from Durham University working on structural electrolytes. Um, I would also would like to acknowledge the funding uh, for this project and if you would like to know something more about structural power feel free to visit uh, the website and learn something more about this and uh, uh, feel free to ask any question I will be happy to answer. Thank you. Thank you very much um, for both of the presentations. Um, so 
now we'll go into some questions. Um, just a reminder that um, if, if you could please put your questions into the Q&A section of um, the webinar as, um, as attendees, you can't turn on your microphones or your videos to ask questions. So please, if you could put them into the Q&A section. Um, so we have a question um, and this is uh, for Sohan. Um, when you press the nanofiber map, to generate smaller pores, do you get any issues with accessibility of these pores? What are the drawbacks for pressing that you can see, or are there any? Uh, hi, Aggie. Um, so basically, when you press the nanofiber mat, you um, you don't get any problem by reducing the massive pore size because those are micron-sized pores, which are totally irrelevant for uh, chart storage. Uh, and you reduce them to, let's say, 400 nanometers, which is still um, large enough to diffuse any electrolytes. That has no problem. Um, if you want to go with uh, more viscous electrolytes, such as like ionic liquids, uh, then you might need to do a vacuum infiltration. Um, and then are there any drawbacks or the pressing? Um, yeah, basically, when you press the fibers, they lose their flexibility. So. Um, that's one of the main disadvantages uh, where you can't make flexible electrodes anymore and they become quite brittle, but they are not um, easily breakable because they are still quite thick. Great. Um, I just wondered if um, either of the presenters had any questions for each other or any comments on their presentations. Thank you so much. Actually, I have a couple of questions. Um, thank you, Servant, for presentation. Uh, I was interested, you showed quite small pore sizes of your material, which obviously contribute to higher surface area. And you said that in case of uh, aqueous systems, you don't have any restrictions yet. However, uh, we know that uh, in aqueous system, you, ex like, you expect ions to be salivated, right? Which might actually uh, be a trouble for very small pores. So, uh, do you consider any problem with that or uh, like? Um, well, I mean, we have no proof for this because we haven't, uh, we haven't done really uh, in detail experiment. We're trying to look into this now um, with SACS and, and other diffraction method. But um, basically, I mean, I expect that these ions dissolvate when entering the pores. And that's what uh, increases the decreases the the Debye length, and that's what makes the capacitance really high, because they lose their salvation shell. So basically, the distance between the pore wall and the center of the ions decreases, and that is creating the capacitance. Is it well uh, explored mechanism in the literature? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, and another question. Um, so, did you try to explore the performance of your system in ionic liquid? Yeah, I'm, I'm doing this now. Um, it's tricky. With this pore size, ionic liquids don't enter. This is too small. Ionic liquids, you need pore size between 0 0.5 and 1. 0 0.7 and 1, I would even say. So beyond 0 0.7 nanometers. Um, so uh, I'm investigating now how to shift the pore size of like half a nanometer. Um, and that can be done, I think, with various techniques, but I'm not really sure yet. So still investigating that. Thank you. Um, so we have another question. Um, so this one's about um, longevity. So um, you say that hybrid superclusters um, live shorter. And if you cover the surface of the care with one supercapacitator and it has degraded, um, are you not in the same situation when you just replace your battery? Um, yeah, it's not clear to whom this question is, but I will try to answer. Um, so if I understand the question correctly, uh, uh, Alexei is comparing the battery to supercapacitor. Is that right? Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't follow the question uh, completely. If you can specify. Yeah. yeah, me neither. I'm not really getting it. <laughs> so uh, maybe if um, Alexi could uh, maybe specify um, what he means by um, by that, then we could um, get an answer for him.
um, or maybe if he's able to, I can um, allow him to talk for a second. If that's that'd be nice. Okay. Yeah. Okay, do you hear me? Yes. yes. Oh, okay. No, I was talking, uh, battery has nothing to do. It was a joke. I mean, when you change a battery, it's not a problem. You take a battery out and you have a new battery. If you cover the whole surface of the car with one super cap, you should think also how long it will live, right? And for instance, John Miller, uh, very oftenly he speaks about that hybrid super cups, they degrade faster than normal super cups. How do you see that? Why you focus your research necessarily on functionalization of your carbon to have also hybrid uh, activity instead of having just a pure, stable, um, ordinary super cap, which will live very long? I see. Um, yeah, you're right. I mean, in general, uh, the topic of replacement of a, of a, like the car, uh, chassis or a roof i mean is problematic in any way and people are working in this direction uh, if you're talking just about making the hybrid supercapacitors which live uh, uh, shorter uh, it's definitely a, a problem that's why we're trying to achieve a high cyclability of our system which probably i didn't address yet uh, but this route is basically uh, the simpler to achieve better performance so I mean, we should we should take a look at the stability of our material, definitely, and we do look. However, uh, I mean, we are okay with the carbon material itself, which uh, serves longer. The problem is that uh, we cannot increase further the surface area of this material, which already reaches um, the maximum achievable performance about one thousand. Uh, but, 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 but do you need that, that much, actually? Uh, if you, yeah, if you so, cover the whole surface, you can play around with increasing the surface area and things like that. And in the end of the day, you will have quite a large capacitor. Because what for you need the capacity? To use a break up energy, right? Absolutely. Like that one. Yeah. That may be sufficient for that. And the other yeah. question, if I dare to ask, it's actually to both of you. I, I recently, I was in a graphene institute in Manchester. And Cockabas was showing me a layered uh, graphene system. It's not the random kind of pieces of graphene mix. There is really a ideal slices with electrolyte in between. Thickness uh, between the slices was, uh, it was like uh, you first uh, wet it with, with, with ionic liquids and you had that kind of system. What is our advantage to have a random kind of packing of fibers and other things uh, but not having, for instance, the the the, the flat layers of uh, graphene. Of course, graphene, and nobody can make you such a huge uh, kind of a uh, sheet of graphene to cover your car. At uh, the mm -hmm. moment, I don't think people uh, produce anything like that. But in principle, in the future, it probably would be possible. So what, what the advantage not having a very nice wooden structure relative to pretty kind of random one? So, I mean, I, I think the in general, the coverage of all the car with a supercapacitor is quite complex task, not only from the point of view uh, of make, uh, like difficult uh, architecture construction, but also because for people still it's hard to think that they are covered with a chemical device around them. But even apart from that, I think the main problem is not how much surface you will cover with your uh, device. The problem is that uh, how big weight it will have. So with the current state of the art of the structural supercapacitor, we don't reach the weight saving, doesn't matter how much surface we use. So basically if we cover all the surface of our car with the battery, it still will be heavier than the battery, you see? So mm -hmm. if you cover less, it will be lower than the weight of the battery, but we will not have the same electrochemical performance. So it's not really, it's not really the uh, figure of merit how much surface we cover. The figure of merit is what the electrochemical performance in terms of mechanical and energy storage contribution. That's why we're focusing on different routes of trying to increase uh, the capacitance of our electrodes. Okay, thank you. I mean, I can also add that graphene indeed is probably the most, one of the most promising materials so far. I don't know in terms of structural application if that also uh, 
uh, stands out. But in terms of performance and packing density, that's definitely promising. Um, I think one of the problems of graphene is first the resource and two the costs. And given um, all what's happening in terms of uh, biorefinery and trying to um, produce more biofuels, we will have a growing amount of bio waste and uh, we need to um, manage these bio waste. And of course, battery materials is not one application, but that is one of them. Thank you very much. Um, we just have time for one last question um, in the Q&A section, and this is um, from Billy Wu. Um, he's asked, how um, homogenous was the electrochemical and chemical deposition of MnO2 through carbon fiber and aerogel electrodes, and did this affect the um, conductiv um, conductivity much? Um, so uh, the, um, the coverage of the electrode was uh, fairly homogeneous, uh, but it also depended on the deposition time. Um, so the, the time scale which I showed is, let's say, more optimized. Um, the problem here is it's very hard to say how homogeneous is the position of manganese oxide inside of the carbon aerogel pores because they're extremely uh, small and it's very hard to observe them at SEM. Uh, from what we see on the surface, we have a thin coverage, but we do expect that it's not um, the one, the manganese oxide, which gives us the highest contribution to the performance. So it's very hard to judge, but from the from external surface, we can see that manganese oxide uh, is quite uniformly distributed. And um, um, formation of in a film, let's say, with the reduced deposition time, does not lead to improved conductivity, or in reverse, like form a thicker layer during one hour of the chemical deposition, and does not really show more pronounced drop of uh, conductivity. So I would say it's it's still more or less optimized in terms of conductive performance of the electrodes. I actually have a, a last question just regarding to this. How do you control the, the phase of the MnO2 deposition? Because so, they have difference in pseudo capacitive contribution. Uh, yeah, we, I was exploring the phases which were deposited, but um, I, skipped, I skipped the slide just to not make it too uh, fundamental, let's say. Um, so we have a hexagonal Achtenskite um, structure. Uh, crystal structure of manganese oxide. Um, this is this is the manganese oxide which we which I was previously working uh, with and which shows uh, sufficient increase of sodium capacity contribution. Uh, we do not really uh, try to explore other. So I wouldn't say we choose it. We just know that uh, with these electrochemical uh, deposition conditions, we can get this microstructure or crystal structure of our manganese oxide. So this is the one we get, but it's not okay. something we really control. Okay, good, thanks. Um, so I just want to close by saying thank you very much uh, to both our presenters um, for such informative presentations and also for getting through so many questions. That was um, really great and um, really good for our audience. Um, so a recording of this webinar will be put onto the IMSI YouTube channel very soon um, and you can find a link for this within the chat function um, and you can find all of our previous webinars on there as well and um, our previous briefing paper launches and all of our info videos. Um, so the next webinar in this series will be on the 24th of September at 11 o'clock and it will be on the theme of machine learning methods for battery electrodes and this will be presented by Stephen Kench. Um, I just want to say again thank you so much to both of our presenters um, and I hope that everyone has a nice day. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.